Good morning and welcome on this beautiful Sunday. Uh, as always, I hope that this finds you well and you're doing all right as we continue to be encouraged to stay at home and, and isolate and keep social distance. I'm um, not sure how much longer this is going to last, but I know that we can endure it and thank you for all your care for one another and uh, in this, this strange time. Um, just a couple announcements this morning. The first thing that I want to do is just offer a, uh, a very heartfelt uh, world, word of thanks. Uh, thanks to Rebecca, who is here again this morning to play, and thanks for Jamie, who is also here, as always, running our tech booth. Uh, without them, we wouldn't be nearly or maybe at all uh, capable and qualified to do this for you. Um, but mostly, I, I also want to thank you all for all the amazing support that you have continued to give this congregation throughout this time for everything that you've been doing to reach out in the community, to reach out to one another, to support each other. Um, that is really what keeps us glued together. And we've gotten so many words of encouragement from you for what's happening here in the actual facility and what we've been trying to do to keep everyone connected. Uh, we really appreciate the encouragement. And I was just saying to Rebecca this past week, to Jamie this morning, how wonderful it is to be part of a congregation that in this very strange time, what would be so easy to grouse and complain, that it's brought us together in a very unique way. And we've really been hearing so many wonderful and positive comments. So thank you for all your support, all you do for each other, all you're doing for the community, all you're doing for this congregation. Um, along those lines, this past week, we usually, as you know, have our second Tuesday community meal, and uh, this past Tuesday was absolutely astonishing. We did a drive-through pulled pork sandwich meal, and we had two incredible blessings come our way that evening. Um, the first blessing was that there were quite a few people who were not able to give any donation, and we were able to give them a, a delicious and full meal for whomever needed it. And from what I gather, the portions that were given out were sufficient to last more than one day. So multiple meals out of a single serving. Um, and that was a wonderful opportunity for uh, us to give into our community. And the flip side of it is that uh, so many people came through and were able to give a donation. And just to give you that, that figure, we received about $1,035 in donations through that meal and pretty much sold out. So thank you so much to everybody that came and supported us. Uh, I, I know we're going to do it again. And just keep your ears uh, and eyes open for whenever that date's going to be and whatever delicious thing that I'm sure John is going to come up with next. Um, the final thing is a nuts and bolts thing, and, uh, and this is again an opportunity to, to thank you once again. The generosity of our congregation has been absolutely overwhelming. Um, people have been mailing in their, their gifts, they've been dropping them off in the office, and certainly that's the most efficient way if you want to continue your giving to do so. But if for some reason that's not something you can do in terms of how to get it to the congregation and you would like to continue giving, we have finally got up an online method for giving set up. And I'm going to tell you how to get to it right now, and then we'll drop it for the rest of the, the service. So all you have to do is go to our website, www.marionfirstumc.org, and that's M-A-R-I-O-N. And when you get to the site, you can actually link to it from our Facebook page. Click on the Contact Us tab, and then there you'll see to the right of the page a Donate button that will go through PayPal. You don't have to have a PayPal account to do it, and it is a completely safe and easy way to, to do your giving online. I was asked to give full uh, transparency when we do giving online. 97% of what is given goes to the church, 3% goes to a transaction fee. So, like I said, it's more efficient to give directly, but if you'd like to give online, it's certainly a great way to do it as well. So that's just a kind of a housekeeping thing 
uh, to get, get put to bed here as we get ready to worship together. So I hope that you are comfortable at home. I actually had someone tell me this past week that they're not really sure that they, they're, they're, they're all that comfortable coming back together again because it's very nice to be able to sit with a latte in your pajamas and, and, and do worship at home. Um, I know, though, that, that, that we all are looking forward to getting back together again, seeing one another, and, and feeling the energy that it is when we gather together. So as we once again worship in a very unique way, I ask that you'd bow your heads with me. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we live in a time where we have the technology to continue to come before you together, even while we are far apart. So I ask that you would bless each person where they are at this morning. I ask that you would warm their hearts. I ask that you would speak through these strange times and strange means to uplift us, to encourage us, and Lord, to continue to help us shine your light in whatever ways that we are able. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first hymn this morning is a very familiar one. It is In the Garden. Our next hymn is Jesus is all the world to me.
right. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Jamie and I were just enjoying the empty sanctuary that uh, makes us a little bit less self-conscious so we can move with the music as we felt so moved. <laughs> well, it's hard, you know. And he walks with me and he talks with me. It's good. It's good. Now, if I break into that when we're back together, I will expect you not to point and laugh, but to join with me in, uh, in, in the fun. Um, this morning, in the way of prayer requests, we want to lift up Susan Christopel, who has been given the orders by her doctor that she has to do six more weeks of uh, recovery before she'll be able to get back to work. Uh, we also want to, uh, we have a joy, uh, baby Campbell, who has been in the, the NICU for a bit and was born premature just before Easter, came home. And so that's a wonderful celebration, and we want to just uh, lift up the family and pray that everything continues going well. Of course, we want to continue to keep our, our communities and our nation and, and the world indeed in prayer, um, especially as people are trying to figure out what is the right balance of how to get things moving again in terms of the workforce and at the same time make sure everybody stays safe. We want to ask for uh, good judgment, good reason, and, uh, and much care to be taken um, so that the best balance can be struck. So would you bow your heads with me? Gracious God, we come before you once again in a, in a troubled time. Well, we know that there are many people that are hurting for many reasons, or people who are sick and, 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 and uh, experiencing a brokenness of body in so many ways, those that are enduring the, the virus that has everything so locked down, and Lord, those who are experiencing disease and sickness that have been going long before this virus ever came on the scene, but we ask that you would be with them and give them a sense of hope, and we ask that you would bring healing. Lord, for those that are caring for them in the places where doctors, nurses, caregivers are feeling overwhelmed, we ask that you would give them endurance and strength and patience and protection, Lord, from the situations they encounter each and every day. For those that are feeling incredibly cooped up and going a little stir-crazy. We ask that you would help us to remember the reason that we have these protocols in place and help us to see a greater good at work and help us to be creative and patient with ourselves and with those that we happen to be staying with as we wait for this time to come to its inevitable end. And Lord, we trust that this end will come sooner than later and that if we follow the wisdom that you speak through those that understand these kinds of matters, that we'll come through it better, we'll come through it healthier, and Lord, that on the other end of it, we'll come through it more joyful and celebrate as we reunite. Lord, we ask that you would give wisdom to our global, national, state, and local leadership we understand that we're in a very precarious time where the economy is in dire straits and at the same time our, our health has got to take a significant priority. And so, Lord, we ask that you would grant them wisdom to strike the right balance and to have the right patience and the right timing of when to do what so that we can find the, the plan that is going to move us through this most effectively and most safely, and Lord, do it together. Lord, in a time where people are feeling stressed and, and, and many upset and concerned or afraid, sometimes we see the divisions between us rather than become more shallow and, 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 and bring us together, sometimes we see them deepen and become sharper. And so I pray that you would give each of us a sense of peace of mind, grace with one another, and a sense of compassion as we speak and communicate and, and interact and converse, Lord, so that this doesn't become something that when we're on the other end of it has widened the gap between us but has closed it significantly. Lord, we know that you're with us through all of this. We know that you love us. We know that you are keeping us. We know that as long as we entrust ourselves to you, that no matter where we end up on the other side of this, we can do so with a peaceful mind and a peaceful heart. 
Lord, this morning we lift up before you, Susan. We ask that you would help her to do as the, the doctors have instructed, whatever she needs to do to, to get her body back in a position to return to work. We ask that you would give her the wherewithal to complete those tasks, and Lord, we pray that you would bring that healing quickly. We thank you for baby Campbell and Lord, for a return or a, a, a new trip home. And we ask that health and, and goodness would continue with child and family. Lord, I lift up each and every member of our congregation and community. Lord, we thank you that you continue to bind us together through your spirit. We thank you that you continue to call us together and encourage us to love one another as you love us. And we ask that that love would nourish and sustain us through the days and weeks to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so our scripture this morning is a little slow on the uptake. Some say that about me a lot of times. There we go. So our scripture this morning comes from the 24th chapter of Luke, verses 13 through 49. This is a little bit of a lengthy one today. Now that same day, this is Easter, this is Resurrection Sunday, that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they kept, were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more... It's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So when he went in to stay with them, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. 
I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in this city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of our Lord. So today, last week, we talked about the fact that we're kind of going to have two Easter's this year. We had Easter last week, and we're going to have another feeling of resurrection whenever we're able to kind of get turned loose from being all cooped up. So if that's a second Easter, this is a second Easter lesson. This is Easter part two. Because typically on Easter, when we talk about the resurrection, we focus primarily on that moment when the tomb is discovered, the empty tomb. And we talk about the excitement, and we talk about Jesus being risen, and the angels that are there, uh, depending on how, which gospel you read, it might have been one, it might have been two. And we talk about, you know, running back with excitement and telling the disciples that the tomb is, is, is empty. And we have all of this wonderful joy and celebration about the resurrection, and this is good, and this should happen. This should be the focus of Resurrection Sunday. But that's not the only thing that happened on Resurrection Sunday. And looking at it through the lens of the people that experienced it first, and these later stories from today, gives us something additional to take from this resurrection experience for ourselves and our own faith. Remember last week, one of the things we talked about that is in Mark's gospel, he talks about the fact that when they discovered the empty tomb, they were amazed, but they were also terrified. And that terror was well-placed. Because here they were, remember, they were friends of Jesus, the guy who had just been, been sentenced as a rebel against Rome, a blasphemer against God by the priests, and crucified for it, and they were his followers. So the initial fear is, are we next? I would imagine that the ones who found the tomb and saw the angels there may have feared something else. They're going grief-stricken. And here they come to the tomb, and they see the stone rolled away, and there's nobody in there, and there's some dude in white sitting there giving them this message that he's not there anymore. And I would bet that at some point, they feared that they had lost their minds, at least for a moment. That their grief had overtaken them, and perhaps they had been hallucinating. I would imagine there may be another fear that came across them. Because we see that the empty tomb was verified. They go back and say, hey, the tomb is empty. Some other guys come up and say, yep, it is. Now you remember that one of the concerns of the priests why the guard was placed there is that someone might come and steal the body away. And so I would imagine, at least if it were me, I would be wondering where did the body go, and if it was stolen, who are they going to try to pin it on? Probably us. So these guys had a lot of reason to be fearful. And I'm going to suggest that the fear blinded them to being able to see Jesus. It tells us that these two guys on the road to Emmaus, it says they, they were prevented from seeing Jesus, but it doesn't tell us what prevented them. And I'm going to suggest that it was, in part, their fear. Now, something that's important for us to keep in mind is this, that... This is not a version of fear cancels faith or, or doubt diminishes faith. Those two things are not accurate. Many times fear is what deepens our faith because it draws us closer to God in the moment. Doubt deepens our faith because when we doubt, we dig. And the more we dig, the more we come closer to the truth of Christ. And the more that happens, the closer we get to him. So our faith actually grows from those two things. However, fear can blind us to seeing Jesus, even if he's right in front of us. Now, I'm going to say for the, these guys it was fear at the moment, but 
understand that there's a lot of other things that can blind us to seeing Jesus. Pride, greed, bitterness, complacency, apathy. All of these things can cause us to miss the Jesus all around us. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. But these guys on the road to Emmaus, they're just coming from Jerusalem. We can see it's as if their faces are downcast. So they're not feeling really good about things. And Jesus himself comes right up to them and says, Hey, what are you guys talking about? And I can't help, he plays dumb. And I can't help but think that as these two guys are unloading this stuff, that maybe a part of Jesus is chuckling on the inside. Like he doesn't know what has just happened in Jerusalem, because it happened to him. So they're telling him what happened to him from their own perspective. And they said, hey, there's this, this guy named Jesus. He's this prophet, great teacher. Lots of people loved him. But the priest turned him over to Rome and they killed him. And here we thought he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. Now, just a little quick note here. We had talked about this before, and I kind of like it, so I'm going to point it out. Remember, we had talked about the Gentile term for Jews was Jews because they came from Judea. Actual Israelites would have referred to them as Israel. That's their nation. Even though they're scattered, they still see themselves as the people of Israel. And so they still have this sense that the Messiah is going to come and liberate Israel in some great military conquest. And at that point, Jesus has kind of had enough. And I kind of, again, you know, I try to imagine the way the feelings go when we read this stuff, not just the words on the page. And I kind of feel from Jesus a sense of, all right, boys, sit down, let me tell you a story. And it says that he goes and he starts with Moses, and he explains all of these things about the prophets and about the scriptures to help them understand what was really being said. And then they approach the village, and they're getting ready to go to the village, and Jesus keeps bebopping down the road. He's like, it's been real, guys. And they say, wait a minute, this is that hospitality of the culture. It's getting evening. Come with us. Stay with us. And this is a really cool part. They get and sit down to eat. And Jesus takes the bread and breaks it and gives thanks in an image of communion an image of the Last Supper. And at that, this point, they see him. They know it's Jesus. And then, poof, he goes, just as he disappears. And then the quote that comes next is fantastic. Didn't you feel the stirring within as he was teaching us on the road? And they take off to go share the news with the other disciples still back in Jerusalem. This is a good place to pause when we talk about keeping our eyes open. These two were afraid, and I think that prevented them from seeing Jesus because he's dead. You're not expecting to see him show up on the road next to you. But the other thing that kept them from seeing him for who he was, who he is, is the baggage from their upbringing. They had assumed they knew who the Messiah was supposed to be. They thought they knew what the score was. This is what he's going to look like. And if he doesn't look like this, it can't be the Messiah. And this is summed up when they say, we thought he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. 
But now we're clear that he wasn't. And Jesus sees that they clearly have misunderstood something that they have been taught all their life. Because of what they had been taught about it, the scriptures hadn't changed. But what people had told them about the scriptures was wrong. What they had told him them about who Jesus would be or what he would look like was wrong. And he, he tries to open our eyes to it. But I'm going to suggest that even after he goes through all of that, they still didn't quite believe it. It wasn't until they recognized who he was that this wasn't just some random guy on the road spinning yarns about scriptures, that this was Jesus himself. Now they knew the risen Christ, and their perspective changed. Their eyes were opened. Their hearts were opened. And this is the first thing I want to help us understand about keeping our eyes open. We don't just have to keep open our eyes, we have to keep open our hearts. We have to be willing to admit we might be wrong. We have to be willing to admit that our perspective of Jesus might not be exactly who Jesus is, no matter how long we've held it. And this is not an easy thing to do. I think these guys were in a position that many people are in today. They have been raised within their people, raised within a culture. To see the Messiah as something different was considered a horrible thing. Because you're bucking the tradition, you're bucking the leaders, you're bucking the teachers, the one that said, no, this is how you believe, and if you don't believe the way we tell you to, there's something wrong with you. Because this is the truth. And Jesus comes along and says, that was mistaken. That was mistaken. I don't get a tone of condemnation here. Just, uh, I'm going to open your eyes to the reality of it now. And how many times do we resist reinterpreting? How many times do we resist shifting our perspective, not because the new perspective is wrong, just because we're afraid of upsetting the people around us? What if my friends no longer like me? What if my family disagrees with me? What if, what if this person that I've been looking up to for my whole life hears that I disagree and thinks less of me? And the more dogmatic the message, the greater that fear becomes. There are even places where you might be shunned or ostracized from your faith community because you think differently. Now, I, again, I, I like to put little, little checks into these things. This isn't saying we run off willy-nilly and just because we don't like an interpretation, we make up our own. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that we need to be open to discussion. We need to be able to ask questions and to challenge Because while much of what we understand about Christ may be correct, if our goal is to become truly like him, then we need to shift away from those things that are mistaken. And that's what was happening with with these guys here on the road to Emmaus. And much like them, we have to be careful because um, so many times, you know, they wouldn't accept this guy's word because they didn't know who he was. They didn't give him any authority. And I would like to suggest that there are people whose name has no marquee value that have a lot of truth about Christ, and we can rely on more than many people who have a lot to lose by upsetting a mass following. Part of how we understand this, and they acknowledge this, is they say, didn't you feel the stirring inside when we heard him. Couldn't you feel it in your heart? We, we talk about this. This is a confirming spirit. We call this discernment. 
That it doesn't always have to be the name that everybody else has listened to this person, but that inside the Holy Spirit many times is working to confirm something, and there's many times where there's something in our gut that we've known has been off for a long time or hasn't set right, and then someone comes along and they give us something that inside of us we say, yes, that makes sense now, everything's coming together, but I don't know if I should believe it because that's going to upset these folks over here. It's not an easy task, but we want to be like these guys on the road to Emmaus, and we want to be open enough to the Holy Spirit to sense that, because let's face it, Jesus is not here in the flesh anymore. And so we rely on the embodiments of Christ around us. That's faithful men and women who we trust with their judgment and the Holy Spirit inside of us to work this out. And if you want some examples, I'd, like, I'd just like to, to share two and a half of, of them with you. We have things, and I'm going to speak to two American issues, because they have them all over the country, anywhere or the world. Anywhere Christianity is preached, every nation has its own baggage it, it imparts onto the gospel that, that has to be cut through. But I'm going to suggest that it is only in America that we could concoct uh, something as half-baked as a prosperity gospel. A gospel that says, you know God's favor rests upon you because you are healthy and wealthy. When we have a savior that says, if you follow me, you can bank on having problems in your life, on self-sacrifice, in a measure of suffering. In America, sometimes we see Jesus with like an eagle on his arm. I've seen pictures of Jesus riding an eagle. And I hope I understand it correctly that what we're saying or hoping to say is that our nation would be the better were our nation to follow Christ. I don't know that that's what the message is, but that's my hope. I'm getting an interesting look from the sanctuary right now. But here's why that image is a face palm. If you don't want a face palm, is it's this. Ugh. The eagle was a symbol of Rome. When the Roman legion would go on march to conquer and destroy, they had a symbol bearer and a standard bearer. And that standard was a big eagle. That's what represented Rome. When it talks about the abomination of desolation standing in the destroyed temple, that abomination of desolation is widely believed to be the Roman legions standing in the destroyed temple with a big eagle. So, essentially, we're smashing together our Savior along with the, 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 the empire that he largely stood against and crucified him. Those two things don't go together. Now, I understand that we look at the eagle as America, but we also have to understand that our Christian history spans more than just the, the few hundred years that America has been in place. And so seeing these two symbols together in that broader span of history doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And this is just two simple examples of where we have things thrust upon us that we don't think through. It sounds good, right? It sounds great. God wants me to be healthy and wealthy. That's a lovely, lovely sentiment to have. God's blessing is on America above and beyond every other nation. That will be wonderful, but we understand that Jesus was the suffering servant, and we were called to make disciples of all nations, and that Jesus is calling to every nation. And I would argue that the further a nation is from God, the louder Jesus is crying out to it in love and hoping they will embrace him. 
So we all have this kind of baggage going on, every single one of us. And, we, and it's so much more than that. And if we're going to see Jesus for who Jesus is, not who I want him to be, but who he is, we have to be willing to let Jesus open our eyes, just like he did to these guys that he was on a road with in Emmaus. And when we do, we have a much clearer vision of how he sees the world, not how I see the world. And that makes a big difference. Now we see a, an, another kind of example of, of what, what happens here when he gets into uh, Jerusalem and the disciples are sitting there and all of a sudden, here comes Jesus again, pops into the room, doesn't say how he got there, doesn't say if he just like poof appeared or did the secret knock or whatever it was, but in he comes and it says they were freaked out too. And here's another little interesting tidbit. If we think goats are a modern fabrication, we know that here that at least they're, they're a few thousand years old. Because as they believed, he was a ghost. And that rigged them out, as you might expect. And then Jesus does something really cool. He says, come on, touch me. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Look, look, look at me. Right? So he does this for a few reasons. First of all, he does it to prove he's not a ghost. Second, he does it to prove his identity as Jesus. Third, I think he does it to set them up for a dinner request. Because I'm sure he was hungry after everything he'd been through, and off they go and give him a piece of broiled fish, and he eats it with them. And that's when he gives them some instruction. It says he opened their eyes. And once again, we see this place, and I would say that maybe he learned something from these guys on the road to Emmaus who couldn't see him right off the bat. And it wasn't until after the fact that they figured it out. First, he gets them to figure out who he is. Then he gives them the message. And that kind of speeds up the process for him a little bit. And he does the same thing for them that he, uh, that he did for the two guys on the road. He helps them understand the scriptures. He reinterprets them in light of who he really is, not who they thought he would be. He reminds them that the victory he is giving Israel, and ultimately the whole world, is not just a victory over any political power. He's giving them victory over sin, victory over the grave, victory that no human can possibly achieve, and yet Jesus has given it to them, and Jesus has given it to us. And we see that becomes the bedrock of this gospel that they go and they preach into the world. But there's something fa fantastic that he says is going to be preached. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And this is cool on a few fronts. First of all, we're going to give it a kickback to what we were talking about before. It's a wonderful message to say that salvation is a free gift, and all you have to do is say a prayer, and then salvation is yours. Believe that Jesus died on the cross, and that's it. You're good to go. But that's not Jesus. That's not the Jesus of the Gospels. The Jesus of the Gospels in the Lord's Prayer says, forgive, one, uh, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And he doubles down on it after he teaches the prayer and says, remember, if you don't forgive, don't expect to be forgiven. And here he says another thing. Repentance for forgiveness of sins. And so what he's saying here, and this is important, if our eyes are open to the reality of what's going on here, it changes our language. It doesn't change the meaning. Yes, salvation is a free gift that is not earned. But there is a mark upon those to whom it is imparted. There is a mark of what true belief looks like. And Jesus lays that out for us. True belief manifests itself in forgiveness, in mercy. True belief manifests itself in being willing to change when we see the parts of our lives that are out of step with Christ. So it's not just a prayer and a statement of belief. There's more to it. And this is not about earning. This is about truly being transformed. And what's awesome about this, and I love this piece, Jesus starts the disciples' ministry out at the exact same place 
that his ministry started out. Jesus' ministry starts out at the baptism of repentance by John. And what does he say to the disciples? Go preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so we see this amazingly consistent thread woven throughout all of Jesus' ministry, extending through the disciples, and we hope and trust and pray all the way from the disciples to us and into the future. And it's why whenever Jesus heals somebody, forgives somebody, there's the tagline, now go and sin no more. Repent. Do differently. Course. Correct. We've got to keep our eyes open. The disciples saw Jesus, but they didn't see Jesus. They thought they knew Jesus, but they didn't know Jesus. Until he opened it up to them, and then they finally had their aha moment. And the same is true for you and I. We have to open our eyes and our hearts, keep them open so we can see and know Jesus. Part of the beauty of the Gospels and the Epistles and the book of Acts is that through them we get to see the character of Christ. We get to know him. It's hard to see someone that we don't know. And, and, and when we let ourselves dive into the Gospels in the New Testament and try to do it in a way that is removed from whatever baggage we have behind us that's telling us what to think and simply let Jesus speak to us, we start to see him for who he really is. And this is so important because then we really do start to see him all around us. Because Jesus is no longer just a physical body, but Jesus is a spirit. Jesus is a value. Jesus is something that wells up from within and we see without. Jesus is a binding force within the universe, within our nation, between our relationships. And what we see when we look around, when we see every kind word, every loving act, every compassionate act, when we see everyone putting themselves on the line to care for somebody else, we see a kind word to a crying child, we see someone handing some food to somebody that's in need, we see people sacrificing of themselves willingly so that somebody else can have another leg up on life, we see the employer who gives the employee a second or a third chance because they see the potential in them. All of these things we see Jesus all around us every single day. But do we? Or do we chalk it up to something else? Every one of these acts of love and mercy is Jesus in our midst. We have to open our eyes and see it. Maybe the bigger challenge is this, to open our eyes to see if we are looking like Jesus to someone else. There's no shortage of people out there that will take our bad behavior, our discompassionate attitudes, callous words, uh, unkind hearts, bitterness, and somehow twist them to justify Justify it through Jesus. We're all tempted to those moments. We're all human. I'm tempted to those moments. Convenience is really convenient. But this is also the beauty of the words he gives the disciples. My disobedience, my fault, is not the end of it. Because he says repentance. So if my eyes are open, like the disciples and like these guys on the road to Emmaus, and if I see Jesus, then I can course correct. And if I course correct, then my life shines brighter. Your life shines brighter. Our lives shine brighter. And in the world around us, we need all the light we can get. 
And so I want to encourage you to, to, to look to your scripture, to go to prayer, so that we can know Jesus. So if we can know Jesus, we can see Jesus. And if we can see Jesus, then we can want to be like Jesus. And if we put all of those things together, we can become more like Jesus. And the light gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter, day by day by day. And eventually it gets to a place where no one can ignore it. And that's my hope and our prayer for you and I. That we get to the place where our lives are such that no one can ignore them. <clears throat> not because of our volume, not because of our pride, not because of our wealth status or anything else, but because of our love. And know that you are loved. Let's finish up with God be with you till we meet again. Go in peace.